Good evening, my name is Jerry Cochran and I'd like to call the City of Pasco Planning Commission to order. I'd like to welcome all those in attendance this evening and ask you to join me in reciting the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with Present. Jay Hendler. Present. Jerry Cochran. Present. Mr. Chair, there are six members present. We do have a quorum. Excellent. Thank you. The Planning Commission is an advisory board made up of volunteers appointed by the City Council. The purpose of the Planning Commission is to provide recommendations to the City Council regarding changes to the City's comprehensive plan land use updates, block grant allocations, and zoning code. The Planning Commission is tasked with considering long-term growth and development of the community, the impact of land use decisions on the community, livability, economic opportunity, housing affordability, public services, and the environment. I'd like to remind the audience that tonight's proceedings are being broadcast live on the City of Pasco's Facebook page uh, and on Charter Spectrum Cable PSE Channel 191 and will be rebroadcast uh, several times uh, during the next month. This meeting is also being recorded so you can watch it on the City of Pasco's website which is pasco-wa.gov. Click on the video on demand link and make your selection there. There should be copies of the meeting agenda available online and uh, you also may you can follow along and there may be ones available in the back of the room as well. At this time, I'd like to ask the audience to make sure you mute your microphones and cell phones so that we can uh, prevent any interruptions during the meeting. For those present this evening, when you're given the opportunity to address the commission, please raise your hand so we know you'd like to speak or address the commission. Uh, come up and speak clearly into the microphone and state your name and city of address for our records. But before we get, begin, I need to remind the audience that, and the Planning Commission that Washington state law requires that public meetings like the one that's being held this evening not only be fair, but also appear to be fair. In addition, Washington state law prohibits Planning Commission members from participating in discussions or decisions in which the member may have a direct interest or maybe either benefited or harmed by the Planning Commission's decision. An objection to any Planning Commission member hearing any matter on tonight's agenda needs to be aired at this time or it will be waived. First of all, are there any Planning Commission members who have a de declaration at this time regarding any of the items on this agenda? Let the record show that none declared. Second, is there anyone in the audience this evening who would object to any of the Planning Commission members from hearing any of the items on the agenda? Let the record show there were no de declarations. We value your inner input. As, uh, we as the Planning Commission members need and value that input. It helps us to understand the issues more clearly from all sides and make better recommendations to our City Council. Furthermore, in many cases, your input here at the Planning Commission meeting is your only opportunity to get your facts and opinions expressed and placed into the record, the official record of the City Council that will use to make its decision. So I encourage everyone to take advantage of the full, uh, full advantage of this opportunity. Uh, the next or first item on the agenda here is to approve the minutes uh, from the May, or I'm sorry, the April uh, 2022 Planning Commission meeting. Those meeting minutes were mailed out to the commissioners ahead of time and provided online. I trust everyone had the opportunity to take a look at them and I would ent entertain a motion to approve the meeting minutes. This is Commissioner Bowers and I make a motion to approve the meeting minutes from the April 21st meeting. 
Thank you, Commissioner Bowers. Do I have a second? Commissioner Handler, I second. Thank you, Commissioner Handler. It's been moved by Commissioner Bowers and seconded by Commissioner Handler. All those in favor, say aye. 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 Any opposed? So let the record show that the meeting minutes were unanimously approved. Uh, we next item on the agenda of any unfinished business. Uh, we have no old or unfinished business, so we will move uh, right on to the public hearing uh, element of our agenda. The first uh, public hearing item is a code amendment, residential design standards, phase one, master file CA 2022-001. And I'll uh, open it up for staff um, staff presentation. Thank you. Uh, thank you, and uh, good evening, members of the Planning Commission. Uh, you may recall that this item has been presented to the Planning Commission uh, several times over the past uh, few months. Uh, tonight's uh, 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 meeting is the second of three proposed public hearings on this particular item. And again, with this one, the uh, intent is to provide uh, a variety of living and housing options for residents uh, today and uh, those that will call Pasco home in the future. Uh, by increasing design standard simplicity uh, with an emphasis on the built and natural environment, in particular on this effort on multifamily uh, design standards. So um, some of these will be duplicate from what we've seen before. We also use the staff report as an, uh, uh, as an attempt to address comments we received at the uh, April Planning Commission meeting. So on the next slide, uh, kind of a summary of those uh, questions or comments that we received, uh, the impacts and feasibility. Um, in particular to decreasing the lot sizes in the R3 and R4 districts, uh, changes to setback standards, the uh, potential implications of off street parking reductions on studio apartments, uh, impacts to the development cost um, and the applicability. And so uh, in the staff report, we, tr we tried to address those comments. Generally, um, on the next slide, you'll see an example of a, uh, the next two slides actually are examples of smaller lots with um, uh, townhome or multifamily units on them and you can see relatively smaller lot sizes with um, uh, with a uh, p potential and feasibility of uh, uh, some nice housing options provided for uh, tenants or, or homeowners um, additionally with some of the other comments um, for side yard setbacks we hope you've addressed in this in the uh, staff report with the uh, five foot side yard setback uh, clarification the off street parking requirement would only apply to the uh, the reduction would only apply to studio apartments and the justification with that is um, not to overburden a project with a minimum um, that may not be based on market feasibility um, they could still uh, supply or build more parking but we don't want to over require on the parking side at least for now on the uh, studio apartment units the implications of the proposal to development cost um, Part of this proposal was initiated by the uh, development community, and we hope you've expressed that throughout this, uh, throughout the planning effort here. Um, and also want to reiterate a, a comment that staff made at the last planning commission meeting, which was many of these things are already in our standards or are things that are already uh, completed or um, uh, built by the de uh, developers and developments. So we're just trying to codify them and actually put them in the same place. Um, they are applicable to all developments, although PUDs are, are a separate item itself. Now, there is, um, when there is a, uh, a, a missing gap in the PUD uh, regulations, for example, they currently defer to the residential design standards, which we are updating right now. So hopefully that, that clarifies some of the, the comments or addresses the questions we received um, at the last meeting. Um, proposal summary in general, uh, updates and uh, addresses lot design setback circulation for both vehicles and uh, non-motorized uh, uh, movement, uh, parking, landscaping, building design, and orientation. So on the next slide, um, again, a, a variety of, of what we proposed over the past few months. This is a change to the lot sizes. Uh, and uh, we're also changing the way they're determined uh, using both a combination of the housing or building type and the residential zoning district, which you'll see on the next slide. Uh, may be difficult to show or to, to see on this screen, but those with an asterisk are those uh, particular changes that were uh, recommended or proposed by the uh, Home Builders Association of the Tri-Cities. You can see as you scroll down on that, they, they uh, alter based on the duplex, triplex option, cottage housing, a multiplex or apartment, uh, units, etc. 
Uh, similar changes with lot frontage and width. This was another uh, area where uh, it was expressed that this can be a barrier for uh, more innovative um, housing types that uh, residents are, are, are trying to see more of here in the, uh, in the region. And on the next slide, you'll see that broken down in the, in the table. Again, um, combination of both the residential zoning district and the uh, housing type itself. So again, this, this kind of emphasizes that being a little bit more precise, it does increase the length of our municipal code, but hopefully in an effort to be a little bit more clear uh, with both those applying and, and those applying the standards itself. And uh, a clip art image of, of what that could look like um, in the application process. The next slide, um, uh, building setbacks. Uh, so we are proposing, uh, again, uh, uh, to the, the biggest change here would be on the rear setback. Um, currently, uh, most of our zoning districts require a rear setback that is equal to dwelling height. So you can imagine that if you have a 30-foot uh, home, it's a 30-foot rear setback. If you have a 45-foot product, that's a 45-foot rear setback. That's in addition to the side, the front, lot coverage, um, parking, et cetera. Um, and so this has been one that's actually been pretty, uh, been a big barrier for us in Pasco. So we're hoping to, to change this to 15 feet, which is similar to what they do at the city of Kennewick. And you can see the decreases to the front uh, setback as well. And then the five foot setback on the, um, uh, uh, for the units themselves. This is the, the portion of the proposal where things get a little bit more subjective, and so we're hoping just to beef up the code um, as it exists today. Again, this is uh, identifying some additional language for residential street and landscaping. Um, again, adequate landscaping, uh, landscaping installed at the time of the development and who it's maintained by, um, increase, um, uh, and, and also in, in some cases a benefit. So an increased sidewalk width may count towards landscaping requirements as well. So we're trying to be flexible, but also ensure that the end product is both um, uh, something that works for the, uh, the, the customer, the resident, and is something that is possible by the development uh, as well. Similar, again, some additional clarity on the entrances, uh, particularly to multifamily projects. Again, some language that addresses access um, uh, and just putting, these, uh, putting this language into the code, whereas right now it's either missing or um, fairly, um, uh, fairly ambiguous. Building orientation. This is already um, uh, uh, partly listed in both the uh, commercial corridor design standards, um, also the 182 overlay district that the city currently has. So this is kind of taking pieces of that and putting it all together in the same place. Parking and driveways, uh, similar, identifying some screening and buffer requirements uh, and a uh, reduction of off-street parking uh, as listed here for studio apartment dwellings. And in particular, right now, the city of Pasco has a, a requirement that on multifamily projects, all of your parking must be located uh, in the rear. And the intent of that, uh, ideally, is to bring the building up to the, to the sidewalk, make it a little bit more um, visually pleasing from the, the pedestrian experience. Um, that, that, is, um, that can become a barrier for some of our housing products. And so we're looking at allowing a portion of the parking to be located in the front or at least um, a percentage of the, the frontage length to be allowed to use for parking. Certainly not all of it. We still want to maintain that building presence towards the front, um, but we do think there'd be some benefits of allowing some of that to happen um, uh, on the frontage side. This is probably one of the ones that's a little bit more uh, critical for us, and that is just defining uh, what we would uh, propose to see uh, on the internal circulation for vehicles for multifamily projects. Um, both the minimum access and the turning radius are, are, are um, already uh, requirements per the International Fire Code. Uh, we've vetted this both with our building and fire departments as well, so this is something that they would like to see as well um, to just increase uh, and, and guarantee that there's some sort of access to be guaranteed for both uh, residents, uh, visitors, but certainly emergency responders as well. On the pedestrian circulation side, uh, staff would um, like to see uh, uh, more pedestrian emphasis in more of a multifamily project. So this is just asking for uh, a description of uh, pedestrian connections within a site plan 
to be clearly visible and lighted. Again, things that are normally provided, but we're just spelling them out. I mean, then a minimum width of a sidewalk or pedestrian path of five feet, which is below our, our existing standards, but because it's internal to the site, we believe that that would be sufficient. Open space and landscaping, again, just some additional language, um, putting this all in the same place. We already have a landscaping a section of the zoning code. Um, so we would uh, make sure that there's um, a no inconsistencies between the proposal or the code as it exists today, particularly, again, to the, the multifamily projects or products. On the next slide, um, height, bulk, and scale. Uh, this is where uh, we are intending to uh, foster some more innovative design um, in our housing uh, uh, developments here in the city. Uh, we also need to be very careful that we're not overly burdensome. Every time we uh, require a different shift in the building, that's a different uh, material potentially or a different angle. Um, so we want to be very careful with that. Um, we've talked this portion over with our uh, consultant on this item uh, at, at length. We believe the proposal of um, the street facade with the modulation as you see on the screen um, is not overburdensome. Um, there are some communities where they go a little bit further than this. I, I think we want to stay away from that and allow still the flexibility to occur by the applicant um, and just make sure that there's some variations to ensure that there's something that we're seeing on the end result um, for the community. Again, this is one where if you have any questions, we're, we're certainly happy to answer or address them. Um, it's just an opportunity for us to specify um, kind of differences in the building types, particularly when they're um, either large or take up significant frontage space. And an updated schedule. Well, we're running about a month or so behind. Um, this is a significant update, though, to the zoning code. Um, so what uh, we'd like to do is uh, use this public hearing as an opportunity to hear uh, any additional comments or questions uh, or concerns from both the Planning Commission uh, or members of the public. Uh, we would recommend that this item be continued to the June Planning Commission meeting where um, it gives um, us time to hear any of those comments. It certainly also gives us time to actually complete the text write-up of the code itself. This is a fairly involved uh, uh, text update to the municipal code. Uh, so there'll be a lot of uh, underlying and strikeout language throughout both Title 21 and 25. We also wanna make sure that we're not missing any other portions that exist in the municipal code. And then with the uh, intent of taking this to the city council for a workshop and uh, hopeful adoption uh, this summer. So with that, that concludes uh, the short presentation on this uh, update. But again, happy to answer uh, any questions I can this evening. Thank you. Excellent, thank you. Uh, first of all, uh, Planning Commission commissioners, are there any questions uh, for staff or feedback on the proposal? This is Commissioner Bowers. I just want to thank Mr. Gonzalez for the pictures. It really helps to clarify what the intent is with each of the categories. Thank you, Commissioner Bowers. I agree. That's great. It's a great ad. Thank you. Yeah, uh, Mr. Gonzalez, what 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 are the restrictions for height? We're actually not proposing any changes to the height, and and I'll be honest, I don't memorize on off the top of my head. I know in the R four district, I think it's forty five feet, oh, okay, um, and forty feet in the R three, and kind of cascades okay, lower. Okay, so it varies. Yeah, by 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 by, by district or zone. Yeah, and, and I guess I would say that the only change we're making to a housing type would be cottage housing, um, which we're proposing a, a height limit of twenty five feet, and the intent of cottage housing is to maintain kind of a smaller. Mm -hmm housing product with a much more open or green space mm -hmm. um, that they surround. So that is the one particular area where we are proposing a specific height um, of 25 feet for cottage housing. Okay. Thank you. And I think we're also detaching height from the setback too. That's another area where height is being impacted too. Yeah, that, that, that area right there would be probably one of the more impactful in a beneficial way for the development community. Excellent. Commissioners, any other Questions or feedback? Yes, Commissioner Mendes, I just have a question on the height. Uh, I guess the, one of the major changes was the uh, was the, the height uh, uh, setback in the rear. Um, is that applicable to future permits, uh, retroactive um, impacts to the 
for the change? Yeah, it would definitely be applicable to any new uh, project or permit applying after uh, a potential code would be adopted. Um, in, I, I would assume that um, in an existing um, a dwelling would be allowed to comply with that as well, take advantage of the new code as well, if adopted. And remind me again, this is also applicable to uh, R1, R2, R3? Correct. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner Mendez. Uh, other commissioner questions or feedback? This is Commissioner Campos. Uh, again, I just want to echo um, just thank you so much, Mr. Gonzalez, for giving us the recommendations and going through it. The pictures really do help as well. You have a question on the parking and driveways. You did mention that, you know, we still want the parking in the, in the back um, and that there would be a possibly a percentage. Do you know what that percentage is would be? And we, we don't have a specific uh, a number right now identified. I think we're, we're um, we've considered 25%. Um, but we also want to be careful that, you know, um, if you've got a thousand parking lots, that's a significant amount uh, right in the front. So we're, we're looking at both a percentage or a total um, length of the, of the public street frontage. Um, that'll be, an, an, uh, that'll be a, an item or a particular component of this code that we'll clarify and highlight uh, at next month's meeting. Okay, thank you. Yeah, I think I would lean more towards the length than the percentage because of the factors of you know, depending on how much parking spaces they have. Thank you. One last call for commissioners, input, questions, feedback. All right, we'll go ahead and open up the public hearing uh, for this matter. Um, as I said earlier, if you want to speak on this matter, please come. go ahead and uh, raise your hand and come up and then speak into the microphone and place, uh, state your name and city of record. We might need to turn. How's that? There we go. Good evening, Planning Commission, City Staff, uh, Caleb Strom, said Octaria Engineering. And here on behalf of the Home Builders Association Development Community, just kind of the representative uh, for that group. Um, so we did uh, prepare a letter in December um, specifically stating the text amendments that we'd like to see. They revolved around uh, lot size, lot frontage widths, and building setbacks. Those are the, the simple text amendments that the, the, the HBA development community proposed um, when we proposed those changes staff informed us that they're working on uh, this more robust change and that we're going to incorporate those into um, and so at the time we thought that was a great idea um, we didn't realize that the extent of the changes that are being proposed and so I just wanted to be clear that uh, what the development community specifically has requested is those simple text amendments that you saw on that table uh, from December uh, reducing the lots, uh, lot areas, and that's that's an immediate need. Um, so we're we're five months into this process, and we're actually actively like our office is actually uh, redoing preliminary plat maps because we're anticipating these code amendments being adopted. Um, since it's delayed, um, we're having to go back to the old code and and reduce some density on on those plats. Um, so to speed it up, uh, that would be our recommendation. Um, I do think um, going to the public meeting in June with the first look at the text amendments and then recommending that to council, um, there's a lot of risk associated with that. And I would, I would ask staff to, uh, once those text amendments are done, preferably several weeks in advance of the public hearing to, to, to let the HBA and the development community review that. Um, because there was a number of changes that you spoke about or that Mr. Gonzalez spoke about um, that the substance wasn't there for us to actively provide comment on. I will say on the uh, on the apartments, we were working on an apartment complex where uh, giving a credit for studio apartments is significant. So if you want more studio apartments, the credit has to be there. So I think that's a great thing. Um, I would generally caution against adding more complexity to the code and more, more restraints, which what I saw was a significant amount of that. 
Um, but again, until we see the actual text changes, um, it's hard to comment um, on that. And let me go through my notes really quick. I, I wasn't able to attend uh, last month's meeting, but I did read through the minutes and I did want to address Commissioner Compost's concern on the 2,000 square foot uh, zero lot line duplex lot, if that was even a feasible um, lot area to do. And it and actually is, we proposed a 20 foot lot width there and there's townhome product that, um, that, that builders have for that 20 foot product and that would require a, a minimum 2,000 square foot lot. So we do have... It's just kind of the nature of the beast with, with the increased um, costs. These fee simple townhomes and duplex locks are becoming more popular and those are the new starter homes and so more flexibility if that's good. Um, and that's it. I just, uh, again, thanks uh, commissioners for donating your time to be here. It's important staff for doing what you're doing. Just uh, keep communicating with us and we want to make this thing successful. Appreciate it. Excellent. Thank you. Do any of the commissioners, particularly, I think Commissioner Campos, he, uh, there was a comment uh, you had. Did anybody want to ask questions to the member? No, I'm fine. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Thank you for being here. Anyone else? Good evening. I'm Stephen Bauman here in Pasco. B4 Development Consulting. Thank you for this opportunity. Um, I'm also a member of the Tri-City Home Builders Association and am in the development community and wanted to strongly, strongly support what Mr. Strom said said in several different ways and ask for clarification in a couple. Um, one of them being not to increase the complexity and burden that we have. Um, clarification on what we have is important and that's um, definitely will be helpful to get the clarification in areas where it's gray, that'll be helpful. Um, one of the areas, a couple of things, um, for, for, the, for new code to dictate the design of a building, and not necessarily dictate it, but say it has to have these components, I think is unnecessary and, and unnecessarily burdensome to developers, or that you have four foot, it has to be a four foot setback by 30 feet and those kind of things. I think that's unnecessary. It increases burden in a time when we have we have a, a lack of housing that increases complexity. It causes housing costs to rise because of additional additional architectural necessary to make those work. I think it's unnecessary and shouldn't be a part of it. Um, could we go to um, one of the slides that talked about the HOA and the maintenance and when that that was necessary. Could we go to that slide? It's where it talked about the HOA and the uh, second bullet point. Let me read here for a moment. So landscaping installed at the time of development maintained by property owner or HOA. Could I have clarity on what that means? Um, for instance, um, the frontage on say road 84 or road 76 or those kind of things. Right now, that is a developer, the developer develops it at time of development. He installs the landscaping. Is this proposal to shift that to the HOA. Currently, that is something that is built at the time of development, but is maintained by the city. Is that proposed to be? I, I, yeah, I'll clarify. This isn't for landscaping in the right of way. Hey, is, is that, that That was my question, okay. yes. Yeah, not, this does not apply. This is internal. Okay, yep. thank you. Thank you for that clarification. And then one more piece of that, um, I think that's really a critical piece is um, if, if at time of development, if we have to install the landscaping at that time, that can be a really difficult thing. I think at, at time of, you know, certificate of occupancy, maybe, if, if we put something like that in there, I can see the reasoning for that. But at the time of development to put in landscaping is, um, it, it gets damaged and you gotta rebuild it. So um, just, I, you get the same end destination, but how, that, how to get there I think would be a critical component. 
and uh, one more piece um, would would incre encourage um, you to let us see the standards before we it gets to the point of making that final um, decision because the development community um, certainly does want to be involved in the process and and would would like to be able to to read the text so thank you very much for the opportunity thank you for being here commissioners any questions all right anyone else here to speak on this item And I assume we have none on the phone, the public. Okay, thank you. I'll make the second call for anyone uh, public uh, wishes to speak on this matter. Oh, great. Shane O'Neill, 6904 Rogue Drive, Pasco, Washington. Clover Planning and Zoning, previous city planner with Pasco. I'm up here to basically clarify for the Planning Commission that it seems uh, the change in rear setback, standardized 15 feet, would increase the minimum rear setback in the instance of single-story homes, where now you have a single-story home, the city measures the, mid, the height at the midpoint of the roof, sometimes that can be 11, 12 feet, and so applying a 15-foot minimum would actually increase it in that instance. That's it. Thank you. Any questions or clarifications on that from staff or commissioners? Great. Make one more call for public comments. All right, hearing no more, I will uh, close the public comments. And uh, before we move on, uh, ask if there's anything else uh, commissioners want to say. Commissioner Handler? Yeah, um, I'm, I, I have a concern, and just I want to express it um, on these 20 foot, lot, 20 foot wide lots, 2,000 foot lots or whatever, and the zero lot lines. Um, visually, if you want to talk about an issue, like how is there any restrictions on how many of those things can be strung together? Uh, that's a concern I have. I mean, I've seen places where it's, it's just a nightmare. They get built and they're not going anywhere and they end up being not very well received, um, in, in, you know, aesthetically. And I'm just, it's a concern I have and I don't know how you can handle it, but, but you know, Four, four zero lot lines or six is one thing, but say, you know, 10 or 20 of them in a row uh, presents a problem for me aesthetically. Just, I'm just, just raising that concern uh, for, for whatever that's worth. Yeah, no, and, and that's, that's acknowledged too. Um, I, I think right now the only code that we would have that <clears throat> would uh, be a parameter in terms of length would defer back to our lot, our block length. Uh, standards which uh, today is 1320 feet so that limits the length of a block so how many 20 foot uh, units could you fit in that with you know right away and and the additional requirements I'm not sure but that's that's the one uh, code we currently have that limits the length of a block is block length which is 1320 feet Sorry. <laughs> thank you. Did you hear me anyway? Okay. Thank, uh, anyway, thank you. Thank you, Commissioner Hedler. I didn't get Rick's <laughs> Great feedback. Other commissioner comments or feedback before we move on? Well, first of all, thanks, staff, for all the work on this. I know it's work. One of the questions I had is, and it goes to kind of the, some of the comments we heard tonight, is, you know, this is, I think this is called phase one. It is a lot to put into one kind of thing. Is, is there a possibility of like phasing or grouping some of these so that you give um, everyone 
a chance to digest smaller bite-sized pieces of it or is it I recognize there's a trade-off between the work it puts on staff as well but I um, I'm just curious we are putting a lot into one and it seems if it's phase one I'm wondering what phase two looks like <laughs> um, so if you could comment on that would be yeah helpful. yeah so are we um, no, I think the, the concern that staff had with only addressing one portion, in particular of increasing density, was, was that we still lacked um, uh, codified multifamily development standards. So in, if we only uh, made changes to the uh, lot dimensions or the setbacks, um, the site setbacks, uh, lot sizes, lot frontage width, et cetera, those that would impact multifamily developments, we still would not have codified language about multifamily development standards in terms of internal access. Now, of course, we can always defer to the International Fire Code. However, we're also trying to put everything that needs to be in our code in the code. Uh, we think it would be a benefit both to uh, the applicant and those staff applying the code if things were described outright in the municipal code. So in, in terms of what uh, potential phase two would look like, uh, the development of that amendment would occur uh, likely at the end of the city's uh, housing action and implementation plan and would identify any other uh, development type standards that need to be refined or touched up or, or corrected, um, along with uh, potential incentives, uh, density bonuses, um, et cetera, that, that could apply uh, to increase housing capacity in the city. Excellent, thank you. And I will say, I think, you know, obviously we're on a schedule, you kind of indicated we're a month behind or whatever, but um, we do have the possibility, um, I would encourage the folks in the public to continue to come back and if, if you feel like we're going too fast, too furious on this stuff, give that feedback to us and we can always continue these to future council meet or uh, commission meetings. Um, but uh, that's an option. Uh, we do try to not uh, delay these forever and we have had you know workshops and stuff. But if that comes to us in June that we feel like there just hasn't been enough time and we get strong feedback, that's helpful for us to know whether to continue it to, the, to July or whether we recommend it to council. So. Uh, we'd, we'd be open to that feedback, so thank you. Uh, any other commissioner comments before we close this uh, public hearing item? Yeah, the, the recommendation as well is to recommend to keep, to keep the public hearing open. Yep. yep. Yeah, definitely. The, the recommendation, we're not voting on it now. We'll car carry it over to June, and we can continue to carry it over into July if we need to, um, if, if that's the feedback, or if we feel like everybody's on the same page and satisfied um, and you know obviously the can't let the perfect be the enemy of the good but um, we uh, also have have a lot of options before we recommend to council so. all righty so um, the next item is workshop items the public that was the only public hearing item so I'll go ahead and turn it over to staff for the workshop item a which is the transportation system master plan update Yep, uh, good evening again, members of the Planning Commission. Uh, this is one of the, the few times we've had an opportunity to share the uh, Transportation System Master Plan uh, with the Planning Commission. Um, this is an effort that began, uh, uh, I believe, in the fall of 2019. Um, so we've been at it for a couple of years with our consulting team. Uh, as a reminder, this is the first transportation plan, specific comprehensive transportation plan for the city of Pasco. And as expected, it's identified both a lot of uh, gaps uh, and deficiencies, both uh, in our standards, our policies, our regulations, and certainly the network itself. And so um, that in itself has um, increased the time and the scope of the, the planning effort itself. But uh, we are at a point now where we have a draft prepared. Um, this is just a workshop and uh, an opportunity for us to give you a high level summary of what's in the, the plan. And then we'll come back um, with a public hearing at the June Planning Commission meeting. So in general, uh, the, the Transportation Master Plan, or uh, acronym the TSMP, uh, if we need more acronyms, uh, it's an opportunity for us to look at our future transportation investments um, that they align with the community's goals, values, and visions for the future. Obviously, Pasco has grown significantly, um, not only um, over the past several decades, but certainly over the last several th uh, years that this effort's been underway. And uh, we'll talk about some of the implications of that growth in our system in this presentation. Uh, so on the next slide, um, hard to see here, um, we certainly provide these electronically, I, I actually we already did um, but put these up on our website as well. It describes how the, the, the master plan fits within the overall framework of planning, uh, both uh, local, regionally and statewide. So obviously we operate under the Growth Management Act. Uh, we have our own uh, separate uh, goals and policies set forth by the Pasco City Council. 
Uh, these are also intended to align with the regional uh, uh, transportation uh, planning office, which is the Benton Franklin Council of Governments, a significant funder um, and distributor of, of federal dollars to transportation projects or local dollars. The TSMP operates uh, below the comprehensive plan, so it's intended to implement at a more um, a refined level the, the transportation element of the comprehensive plan. And so it sits together, kind of nests with both informing the, the six-year transportation improvement plan, the capital improvement plan, which is conducted by the city's public works department. Um, and just wanted to give you a, a, a summary of how it fits overall in the overall planning framework that the city uh, works with. So some of the, the components of the master plan, uh, like any other goals and policies, a plan vision, uh, an evaluation of our existing conditions, uh, recommended improvements and standards for the transportation network, and then uh, one that's been fairly critical for us to um, identify are, are the implementation strategies. So uh, I'll, re I'll uh, emphasize that uh, what we're proposing tonight is just the, the plan itself. There are no uh, uh, amendments associated with the plan. All we would propose eventually is adoption of the plan. The recommendations have to happen at a separate uh, uh, separate effort with the Planning Commission and Council. So uh, here I've highlighted the goals that have been identified in the plan. Uh, obviously coordinating with our regional partners uh, on shared transportation investments, uh, providing safe access for all of our users, uh, preserving the existing system, uh, prioritizing a connected and efficient transportation network, uh, developing a system that supports and accommodates businesses, visitors, all users, um, a support of a healthy and livable uh, community, and developing a complete multimodal transportation system. Apologize for the way this looks, but uh, essentially the, the TSMP, and you've seen this uh, a few times over the past uh, probably year or two, it identified both the uh, challenges and constraints in our system. So it, it does both the, uh, addresses both the uh, uh, safety uh, uh, concerns we have, in particular along Road 68 and Burden at the intersections, uh, Court Street and Road 68, there's a uh, ongoing uh, project right there by our public works team, for example. Uh, also along Sylvester Street as well. Um, it also identifies uh, where we're seeing uh, increased levels of congestion that exist um, at higher, uh, higher, um, uh, in higher portions than in other areas of the city. Again, uh, Road 68 and Broadmoor Boulevard along 182, Interstate 182, uh, 20th Avenue and West Court Street, um, Burden Boulevard, Sandifer Parkway in between Road 68 and Broadmoor Boulevard as well. You've also, um, it might be hard in this map, but can see that this map does uh, try to illustrate that there is a lack of connectivity um, as you uh, go west away from Central Pasco, particularly Northwest Pasco. Um, we've seen some uh, uh, lack of connectivity in the transportation system, which um, uh, disproportionately impacts multimodal transportation users. So um, this is a, uh, a summary of the overall system improvements that have been recommended by the plan. Uh, there's been 49 projects associated with intersection improvements, 16 for roadway extensions, and 126 for wood, uh, roadway widening. Uh, pretty dispersed uh, around the entire community, uh, but uh, again, you'll see a lot of those uh, focus in that northern portion of the city as you expand north into our urban growth area. And on the bike and ped side, uh, bicycle and pedestrian side, um, 16 identif identified improvements. Again, putting those systems in place to increase access to uh, the trails, the, the existing bike network, particularly on the Columbia River. Also increasing um, uh, the facilities uh, as we expand uh, northwest. Um, recent success was with the uh, completion of the Burns Road pathway um, in between Road 68 and uh, Broadmoor Boulevard. This is a breakdown of um, the, uh, the total projects by uh, type. So it's a total of $665 million. Now these are estimates and these will, these will likely change um, on a daily basis, I think. Um, but it's intended to share kind of how the overall uh, improvements, um, the amount of, of funding necessary by type. Um, for example, there's a significant amount, uh, over $375 million for roadway, ex roadway extensions. Uh, versus 40 million for bike and pet projects, intersections at 42 million. Um, it might be hard to see on this screen, but we do have just under a million dollars allocated for uh, future studies um, to evaluate um, 
um, as I've said, uh, the, the growth that's happened throughout this planning process, particularly in East Pasco with the industrial growth um, and obviously in the Broadmoor area. One of the key uh, scope uh, uh, elements when this project or this planning effort was initiated was uh, identifying a, a new functional classification system, uh, updating our freight network. Uh, this is a, a, a part that uh, we work with the Council of Governments at our regional level that then feeds up to the state level for the Freights and Good Transportation System Act. So it allows us to kind of have consistency between the local freight network and um, those that uh, will be considered at the state level as important to freight travel in our, in our state. Identifying some neighborhood traffic management and calming tools. Uh, this could be a variety of, um, of uh, facilities that uh, help to increase safety or decrease speed on some of our local access roads. Um, access management and street connectivity standards. Vehicle mobility targets, so changing the way we measure success in a, in a project. Um, in particular, this uh, the, the traditional way of measuring a level of service uh, would actually harm uh, large-scale projects that do kind of in particular mixed use projects um, or multifamily projects. And as our community um, continues to grow, we're seeing more interest in, in higher density, um, whether it's townhomes or, or, uh, or uh, garden cell apartments or those that are located in particular closer to commercial areas. Um, the, updating that slightly allows us to measure them correctly, uh, in particular looking at vehicle miles traveled versus just congestion itself. Um, and lastly, demand management policies. And this is a, a uh, an area that um, typically is, is driven by the State Department of Transportation, the Commute Trip Reduction Program. That program's changed significantly over the past uh, several years, but it's still a policy, a set of policy recommendations to the TSMP um, that would encourage the city to work with our major employers to decrease uh, uh, sing single occupant vehicle travel uh, when appropriate. So some of the implementation strategies, again, summarizing uh, what's in the plan, uh, probably most important, which is securing the necessary funding for these improvements, uh, implementing the, the neighborhood traffic management tools, updating the vehicle mobility standards, updating the engineering design standards for roadways, bikeways, walkways, and uh, incorporating the TSMP changes to our streets, sidewalks, and subdivision regulations. So they kind of go hand in hand. These are the, the high level um, uh, updates that we need out of the plan, and this is how we implement them or actually change them. I'll read through this. It's, it's a little bit um, difficult to see on the screen, and I apologize for that. Um, it lists sort of the implementation act, uh, action items um, through the TSMP. So on the action items, um, at a high level again, it's to pursue and enact supplemental local uh, funding options to uh, bridge the, the funding gap, uh, amending the city's development code to introduce vehicle mobility standards uh, consistent with this plan, um, develop and implement a neighborhood traffic management program that formalizes this process. This also includes um, uh, an opportunity for increased public engagement. So how can we get uh, more feedback from our residents in a particular case where they're experiencing um, either vehicles that are speeding throughout their neighborhood or um, like sidewalks um, or, or increased um, per perceived safety with vehicles, pedestrians, bicyclists, etc. And then amending the city's design standards to include um, minimum standards for arterials, collectors, uh, local access roadways as described again in the TSMP. And, and it's very hard to see, but in that middle screen, I'm sorry, that middle image, um, it's a description in the, in the anticipated funding amounts for um, that have been identified in the planning effort. Um, and I'll read these uh, for the planning commission and the public as well. Um, so $665 million is the approximate um, uh, dollar amount for the citywide investments recommended in the TSMP. Um, we would have a gap of $360 million through our current improvement program and a uh, $12 million gap through the existing traffic impact fee program. And so the overall sh funding shortfall, ag again, as identified in estimates, obviously, um, for this effort is $293 million. So there's a significant um, uh, benefit to implementing some of these strategies in a variety of fashions. And, and again, this plan just identifies uh, what uh, existing conditions and the growth and what the results are. There's a whole uh, separate effort or uh, separate efforts necessary to actually implement uh, any or each of these uh, action items throughout the future. 
So the last slide just summarizes kind of where we're at with the timeline. Um, we would uh, obviously welcome any discussion from the Planning Commission uh, this evening. Um, we would uh, uh, schedule a public hearing and advertise for a public hearing um, and a recommendation to adopt the draft, I'm sorry, the TSMP um, in June and then uh, go throughout the City Council workshop and adoption process this summer. So. Um, Thank you again for the opportunity to share an update on the, on the master plan for transportation and, and again, happy to answer any questions I can this evening. Thank you. Excellent. Thank you. Um, one quick, quick question. How does this dovetail or connect with, you know, obviously Ben Franklin Transit is different, but how do you coordinate with like how they're improving the bus routes and number of stops and access to the bus system in conjunction with this? I, I think that would and in particular the policies that we, we don't really have policies in place or regulations in place in terms of how we coordinate or collaborate with Ben Franklin Transit. And, and that's, a, that's a gap in our policy toolkit, so to speak. Um, what can we do to, and so, you know, the TSMP would ask, how, what can we do to take advantage of a bus stop? Or what can we do to take advantage of a bus corridor? Um, those, uh, those just don't exist today in our standards or in our policy toolkit, and so, um, that, again, would require a whole separate effort with uh, pretty significant collaboration with the transit, uh, uh, transit staff to make sure we can have something that's appropriate for PASCO that can help both um, then operate with efficiency, but certainly make sure that it's appropriate to, to be in a standard itself. Thank you. Commissioners, uh, questions, feedback, comments for staff on this uh, particular workshop item? Commissioner Handler? Yeah, I uh, just want to say there's a lot of work here. Um, job well done so far. That's all I want to say. Thank you. This is Commissioner Mendez, I have a, a comment, please. Um, so on page one, uh, under uh, TSMP overview, it says the plan will include a priority network for quality bicycle routes and safety enhancements for mid-block crossings on arterial roadways. So. Um, I think the area between Argent and Chapel Hill and even beyond the freeway, I always see people walking there, kids, uh, bicycles, whatnot, and uh, there's no sidewalk per se. I think it creates a safety condition that I hope is addressed in this uh, master plan. I didn't see that area highlighted in the one of the maps that you showed as of concern. So anyways, that was my, uh, my concern or comment. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, I do know it does look like we have some Chapel Hill bike and ped uh, improvement projects in the green there. Is that correct? Yeah, and, and also I think um, we, we've had, uh, we've experienced a lot of new development that we were not anticipating um, even in our comprehensive plan horizon, and in particular the, uh, the heritage area with all the industrial growth and even in some ways uh, 395 North um, Port of Pasco has a lot of their facilities at. Um, it, it may not be specifically called out here. That, that doesn't mean it won't be addressed. I think one of the benefits of the TSMP is that it does uh, identify uh, refined goals and policies. So it allows us to use those goals and policies when we do our annual tip, our six year tip. Uh, and then we can refer back to the TSMP, which emphasizes access and safety. And we can continually do that update as necessary. But right now, we don't we don't have that outside of the comprehensive plan or uh, city council goals and policy or city council goals. This is just another layer of um, I, I would say an emphasis, particular to non motorized users, and in this case, um, potentially uh, mid block uh, crossings or uh, uh, crosswalk enhancements or a sidewalk improvement program. Developing something like that that could be something that we we uh, develop as. Um, uh, a result of the TSMP. Thank you. Great. Thank you for the explanation. Appreciate it. Commissioners, any other feedback or questions? This is Commissioner um, Lerman. Go ahead. Um, it was mentioned that uh, they're looking at possible um, different strategies to be able to get community involvement in the survey process. And so um, I had a couple ideas to share out if, uh, if of interest. Um, the last survey that uh, was sent out to the community was pretty cumbersome. 
And so um, whatever method you guys um, choose in the future to um, maybe maybe test it out um, first to see how well people will be able to navigate through the software that is available. Um, things like QR codes um, posted around light posts and things like that where people will have high visibility to be able to see it, whether driving or walking or standing at bus stops might be able to uh, go ahead and access the survey through a QR code that would be posted. Um, to, I haven't seen this in a long time, but we used to have uh, surveys that are printed on the util utility bills. And then as an auto payer, um, my email, I haven't seen uh, surveys or any kind of informational links like that on my automatic paid um, emails. So there might be opportunities there to be able to reach out to more citizens, including maybe even um, robocalls to meeting with um, ATP and PTO and kind of partnerships with um, parents and residents groups of the school district. Thank you, Commissioner Lerman. Yep. Anyone else? Yes, it looks like to be a quite a bit of work and uh, I think the strategy is right. I know most folks when they think about transportation, the issues you have of con congestion, safety, and connectivity are top of mind, especially when they look at, uh, you know, please uh, do something about Road 68. And then also the, the, I, the thing common I hear when people hear I'm on the commission is always, um, whatever we do, don't recreate Road 68 at Road 100, right? And so uh, I think there's a lot of challenges there that we're gonna have to navigate over the coming years to try to figure that out. So thanks for all the work that's gonna go into that. All right, the second workshop item is memo on the 2022 comprehensive plan amendments. Uh, and so I'll turn it over to staff for that as well. Uh, thank you, uh, Planning Commission. And again, good evening. Uh, this is the uh, uh, an update on the uh, 22, uh, 2022 uh, comprehensive plan amendments. Um, this is the first of many uh, meetings with the Planning Commission regarding annual amendments to the comprehensive plan. And as um, kind of a, a, a starting point, I'd, I'd like to point out that um, this is probably the first time the city's operated trying to comply fully with the Washington State Growth Management Act in terms of how these are um, accepted, evaluated, and then processed throughout the entire process itself. So the process that now exists in the city is much more uh, process heavy. Um, so staff, uh, try to be uh, cautious to the applicants and sensitive to the applicant and uh, ensuring that we're walking them through this um, new process. Um, but the intent is that the Planning Commission, Council and members of the public have all the information available uh, when, when necessary to make the final decisions uh, on these uh, applications. Because essentially you're, you're changing the city's comprehensive plan, which is a city council uh, policy document. So with that said, um, I know I've mentioned this before, uh, they are uh, mandated by the Growth Management Act to happen no more than once per year unless there's an emergency, usually that's a budget issue, um, and that we have an established process that Planning Commission adopted in 2020, I believe, um, in Title 25 of the code. There's two components. One is establishing uh, the docket, and the other is the evaluation of the docket itself. So we're still in the establishing the docket phase. So. Uh, I know at the last meeting, uh, we shared the number of applications that we had received. Those numbers increased. And so I'm happy to announce that all those that applied for comprehensive plan applications um, uh, turned in fully acceptable planning uh, amendment applications. They've all received determinations of completeness. So in total, we have 18 amendments proposed for the uh, uh, comprehensive plan. Uh, 12 of those are uh, citizen or private applications. Six of those are uh, proposed by the city itself. Um, no land use amendments have been processed since 2016. So it kind of maybe explains why we're seeing some uh, an increase in the uh, interest here. This is a, uh, a citywide map that shows kind of the general areas of where the applications are, are proposed to take place at. They're kind of well spread out, although they may be difficult to see on this map, um, both in the Broadmoor area that aligns with the city's Broadmoor master plan to revise the land uses there. You can see some of them uh, on the Broadmoor, uh, uh, Broadmoor and uh, Burns Road um, area. Um, again, south of Interstate 182, um, east of Chapel Hill, uh, up uh, north, uh, 
you, very tiny on this map, but on Wrigley Avenue, there's an application, again, north of Burns Road in the expanded urban growth area that's going through the annexation process. Uh, down by the Pasco Waterfront, by the Blue Ridge, we have proposals, uh, again, on West Court Street along Road 56. Um, West Court Street, um, east of uh, US 395, and um, uh, two significant proposals, one private, one city initiated, one for the downtown Pasco master plan, which is establishing a uh, downtown land use, and then a uh, proposal uh, for a land use change um, in the heritage industrial area that's being circled. Um, so on the next slide, uh, just kind of a, a summary of, of these applications and the change to the land use themselves. Again, I, I, I want to reiterate that these are land use actions, so there's not a permit or a project associated with them. There likely will be eventually, um, but this is simply a land use action. And so uh, we are uh, uh, required to evaluate it based on a land use action, and not, nothing more than that. Um, uh, uh, increase to the low density, that's in the Broadmoor area of about 43 or so acres. An increase to the medium density of about 424 acres. Slight increase to high density a significant increase to the mixed residential commercial land use. And this is our most flexible land use as well. So that, that's to be expected, I think. Um, you can see the downtown with about approximately 154 acres uh, proposed to be in a downtown land use uh, zone or land use uh, classification. Uh, decrease to both the commercial and industrial land uses. And um, a few of them associated with Broadmoor, which is an increase to the open space and a new open space transitional land use that will be uh, proposed via the Broadmoor Master Plan. So again, kind of a summary of what all these applications are proposing at a high level. Um, on the next slide, um, there's a uh, five bullet points uh, with the evaluation criteria set forth by the Pasco Municipal Code. And so the establishment of the docket uh, should, should be made based on the result of these questions, which is, is there sufficient time for council to make an informed decision on the application? Uh, will the city, uh, city staff be able to conduct sufficient analysis to develop policy-related development regulations if necessary? Has the proposed amendment been previously rejected or, uh, for consideration? And will the amendment uh, implement or comply with the comprehensive plan, the Washington State Growth Management Act? And uh, is the proposed amendment, is it better addressed through another planning process? And so we'll do our best in the staff report you'll see at the next meeting, which will be a public hearing to provide as much of the, um, uh, I guess, the answers for these as we can from a staff level. And then it will be um, a, a decision by the Planning Commission to recommend that these items either be um, recommend to council for consideration or essentially to be evaluated or not. Um, so on the next slide is uh, just kind of a general timeline of where we're at. Um, uh, we spoke about this at the last uh, meeting in April. Uh, today's a workshop, and then we will advertise for a public hearing at the June Planning Commission meeting. Um, and another important part is environmental determination with these proposals. Um, it is, we expect to have those determinations ready for the Planning Commission uh, by the June, um, I believe, 19th Planning Commission meeting. So. Again, high level, um, but because there's 18 applications, we wanted to be very careful and, and, and clarify what we can with this um, effort. Um, we will advertise for a public hearing, so um, those property owners within, I believe, 300 feet of each of these um, proposed land use action will receive a notification in the mail. Uh, the city will notify um, via our city website, online, and uh, uh, on, uh, via the Tri-City Herald as well. So. Um, uh, we would expect a, a longer meeting at the June Planning Commission for sure. So um, with that, I'll conclude this presentation, um, but certainly there will be much more on this, um, this item over the next several months. Thank you. Excellent. Thank you. Um, question quickly on the, the item number three, pr the previously rejected. Um, one of the things I noticed about a couple of these were they, they were items that were under consideration for the, the original comprehensive plan and were rejected then, but is it that they weren't rejected as an amendment so they can come back again? Um, is that kind of the, because I'm looking at one of them, like I recognize the corner of Burns Road in 100, that's where those the folks wanted to build the service station, for example, and they're making another run, which is fine, uh, but it, it sounds like because it wasn't a rejected amendment, they they have that ability to do that. Is that correct understanding of how that works? Or? Yeah, so we will make sure to do our research to identify whether one of these applications has been proposed in the past, or if not, and if so, clarify what the results was. In that particular case, the applicant um, 
uh, basically halted their proposal. Um, I, I think also the, the context during what must of 2019 through 2021 was a city was going through a fairly significant up major update to the comprehensive plan. So the consideration of new land uses once the um, uh, the utility analysis or the transportation element were, were completed, um, we're, we're probably not in the right uh, the, the timeline just didn't line up uh, for that proposal. Now that our comprehensive plans adopted, uh, now that our TSMP is nearing adoption, um, it would be fair to reevaluate these proposals at both individually, but certainly concurrently with all of the other proposed applications. So if we're seeing um, Earth Planning Commission um, deems that there's too much increase uh, to this particular land use or the opposite to another land use or the locations um, or anything along those lines, it's certainly within the Planning Commission's um, purview to not only recommend a, uh, either approval or denial, but certainly a modification as well. So I wanted to make that clear as well with the, the Planning Commission would be helpful. Excellent, thank you. Yeah, I just noticed there's a couple of them that we, there was a lot of feedback on in the comprehensive plan process and they're here again. And I remember that particular one, there was a lot of citizens that were particularly opposed to that one. And so we hope that they will, I guess, be informed and notified so they can express their dis or their feedback as well. So cool. Uh, questions from the commissioners or feedback from the commissioners on this uh, workshop item? Uh, the, yeah, this is Commissioner Mendez. So I noticed uh, at least five of the applications requesting a um, amendment to go from commercial to residential. Um, I know that uh, commercial, commercially zoned areas are highly valuable and create a balance between residential and commercial and can have some impacts to traffic patterns and whatnot. So I'm a little concerned about that, um, about the impacts and what's driving that. That's my only comment. Thank you. Thank you for that. Anything else, commissioners? Obviously more to come, and it sounds like you uh, say uh, plan for a long meeting because we'll go through eight, eight, all 18 of these, right? Okay, thank you. Commissioners hearing none, I think uh, we can be uh, close out this workshop item and uh, it'll be back in June and uh, for a public hearing. Uh, with that, um, I don't think we have any other business um, unless the staff has any other business for us. Uh, one question I was going to ask, do you need anything from us on the um, Patrick Abara interviews? Is that going all well? And if, has everybody made contact? I know I made contact. He called me last week, and so you're all good? Okay. Yeah, we've actually expanded the interview list slightly. Um, but aside from that, yeah, it's going uh, as expected. Okay, cool. I just thought I, I thought uh, I enjoyed my conversation. It was a good conversation. So um, hopefully that's going well for you guys. All right. Um, any other comments or questions from the commissioners? Mr. Commissioner Lehrman. Go ahead. So a point of clarification, um, when applicants um, apply as they have, uh, it is regular business that they are then notified of the public hearing coming up is that correct yeah for um excuse me um we will advertise for a public hearing um uh, for instance in this case we will advertise for a public hearing at the june planning commission meeting um, we will follow our notice protocol uh, requirements as um, indicated in the past municipal code but i, I believe it's though property owners 300 feet from a um, proposed land use action will receive a, a notification in the mail um, and again we'll, we'll advertise that online and through our um, our standard notification process thank you all right commissioners uh, one last call for any other uh, comments or questions uh, for staff or anybody all right with no further questions or comments I would recommend a motion to adjourn this is Commissioner Lerman. Go ahead. I move to adjourn our planning meeting for tonight. I second. All right, Commissioner Lerman has uh, moved to adjourn and Commissioner Hendler has seconded. Um, moved and seconded. This meeting is adjourned at the 730, 740 p.m. Bye.
Bye.